um, this, I, I have to start by telling you why I got into this research project. Because my whole research trajectory has been actually about um, business and society, organizations and society. So I started by looking at corporate social responsibility. I've looked at women in management as part of social responsibility, environmental um, uh, policy, uh, lots of different things relating business to society. My last research uh, project over seven years was about artistic interventions in organizations, also relating to organization society. So why am I doing this now? Why am I looking at academics now? Simply because I'm puzzled. I'm, s I'm really seriously puzzled, if not concerned. Um, if we I look at the field in which I've been living um, and the colleagues with whom I am still living and working um, of different generations, I really wonder why do we do this? Uh, why do we do some of this to ourselves? And it came to a head for me um, about three years ago when I was really looking for what do I want to do n next. In Germany you have a retirement age, mandatory retirement, so I knew when I was going to stop saying, so what, what is worth my exploring as my last big research program? And I, on the one hand I had a son-in-law who was going through tenure in the United States. <sighs> and at the other end, at the I went to the Academy of Management, had set up all the sessions I wanted to go to and saw on a Sunday afternoon when I hadn't got anything scheduled that there was a panel of very senior academics on retiring academics. I thought this is good, I'm thinking ahead. And so what do you think about, what do you do, how do you prepare yourself for retirement? That's what I thought they were going to be doing. Instead, I entered this room um, of names that you, know, you read a lot and there they are sitting there telling about what they were doing and I thought they were telling me about how they move on. All of them had pretty awful stories to tell about what they would, what they'd experienced <coughs> in trying to extend their activity as academics. So I really thought, I'm seeing what's happening in the younger generation, I'm seeing what's happening in the senior generation, why do we do this? my puzzle. So I wanted to look at why do we become academics? I don't understand it anymore. I've been doing it. I've actually loved it, but why? Um, and why do we actually continue in academia after we discover what it takes? Why do we do this? Um, thinking about it as a research program, I thought, and I, my work has always been international, um, I wanted to see, uh, do academics in different settings um, have different answers to these questions about why do we do it and why do we keep on doing it? Um, and maybe have the reasons changed over time. So I planned to do it internationally and decided to go for Germany because in some ways that's where the idea of what it is to be an academic was born, one could say. At least that's what they say in Germany. Um, uh, if we look at what is happening to what it means to be an academic today, then the processes um, in the United States are having a huge impact worldwide. So I wanted to understand how the um, people in America are experiencing this as academics. And then France, I'm French, I get to go to France. Um, I had easy access to, to people there. And France hasn't followed exactly the same path as Germany um, and certainly hasn't followed the path that the UK is trying to tell the rest of us we should also be doing. Um, so that's how, how those um, uh, countries got chosen. Um, and if you think about academia and its processes of becoming academics, the roots are very old. In some ways, we look at Heidelberg know, the tradition of the Heidelberg University, it has undergone changes, of course, but you can still see um, the, uh, and feel the rituals, the roots that date back to, to the Middle Ages and have stayed relatively stable. Um, each country has its own system of milestones um, that has also remained relatively stable, although there have been some quite significant changes in the past decades. For example, in France, which has a very, unlike the other countries, has a very... Um, uh, the system controlled by the ministries, they've changed that somewhat, not entirely. So there's greater autonomy of the universities now to recruit and promote uh, faculty, which otherwise was, was handled at a national level. Um, in Germany, there's been uh, talking about change and they've introduced an idea about junior professorships to give young scholars a bit more independence than they had in the, um, in the old structure where it was determined entirely by the chaired professors. And as I mentioned earlier, another change has been the international um, extension of, of uh, US evaluation practices and criteria, to just to mention a couple of the kinds of changes um, that, that we've had. So 
what I did was I started conducting interviews, I'd think two or, two or three years ago. Um, and in the meantime, I have been interviewing, I chose just social scientists, broadly defined, um, because I, I understand what they're doing, and I wanted to have people who are not limited to um, financing of a lab, for example, as a natural scientist might be dependent on it, so that they would have the choice, as these people that I mentioned at the Academy of Management were seeing how they could project themselves into the 80s, 90s, and 100s. Um, uh, so, so far, I have um, interviewed about 100 scholars in these three countries, and I started with people who became academics in the 60s, um, and the, those most recent ones are so starting to become academics in 2015, whereby I define that as having completed a PhD or a doctorate and, and taken on their first post. For this presentation, I have not analyzed everything. Um, and I'm not sure for the chapter, you know, whether I'll use the whole 100 database if you wanted it. You said you wanted it in, in November or so? No, October, you said. So I'll see how many I, I get analyzed by then. Um, uh, the people that I'm, uh, so here he I've just got um, eight women and men from each of these three countries um, with the distribution over time. They are in, in, in universities, um, in business schools, or in, in research centers outside the universities. Some business schools are embedded in the universities, usually in the US, but not in, in other countries. The way I've been doing this is conducting sort of unstructured narrative biographic interviews, which have all been taped and transcribed. And I've taken a two-pronged approach to um, analyzing it. We were talking about that, that but yesterday, the I grew up in the old-fashioned way of using a Word document and, and coding it and sep creating separate documents as I was coding that way. Um, recently, I've decided to modernize a bit and discover what is Max Gude are, how does that work, um, and I found that quite stimulating, but also very fragmented, um, to get lost in too much detail. So, so it's useful and, um, in parallel to that, have been going through each case um, and writing a thumbnail sketch of each of the um, respondents in light of the particular questions I'm asking, for example, for this paper. So I'm finding this double way of, of, um, of analyzing it useful. For the um, literature that I was using to start you know, frame my, framing my analysis, we've got on the one hand the very traditional view of um, academia as a calling and was it uh, like if it, i think you ci you cited max weber today, today i think the idea of, of of a vocation and max weber wrote about ac academics as a vocation um which is experience in early adolescence sometimes with this moment of enlightenment like you said um and a commitment then for life uh, that involves the heart and the soul um and an idea that you're doing it not art for art's sake as you were citing but science for science sake um, and it's definitely a recognition that it takes a, a capacity to withstand years of testing before you actually s you know, become an academic, before you secure a position. And th on the one side, there's these, this with sort of clear milestones, but that very early beginning. And then you've got traditional career theories that also emphasize early and proactive planning. Um, so they rely less on the enlightenment, very much on planning. You've got milestones, you should be trying to plan your career. And we've got career advisors today who are also still telling our young people, you should know what you want to do, and this is how you get around to doing it. Mm. Um, so that's um, the literature that I started with, obviously. And then listening to my um, respondents, I realized I need to get some more literature on board because many of them are talking about um, luck, about chance, about things happening unplanned. So I pulled on board then some uh, literature on what's called happenstance learning theory that emphasizes both planned and unplanned situations as part of a learning uh, development. So I'm going to summarize some emerging findings and illustrate them in a minute. Um, so I can distinguish between those that correspond to what the literature suggested I, I, I be um, finding and th then some points that are different. So unlike um, the literature, there was very, very few who experienced an early calling to academia. Um, mostly it emerged later, um, sometimes during graduate studies and sometimes actually having left the graduate studies, going and working elsewhere, and then finding that there was something that was calling them back into, into academia. Of course, I'm so curious where you would raise your hands if I were to ask you here, where <laughs> what happened to you? Um, they, I quote, as, as expected from the literature, most experienced years of uncertainty and testing about, you know, are you going to make it? Are you going to be part of this? Um, 
back, unlike the literature, um, many did not have a clear career plan, unlike what the career literature t suggests to us. In fact, the, exp the expression stumbled into academia in one form or another. It came up quite a lot in, my, um, in, in the interviews. And what struck me maybe even more than that was how many often said they didn't realize what it meant to be an academic until they'd actually gotten into their first job. So if you think about what it takes to get into academia, you've gone through school, you've gone through university, you do a PhD, which takes a certain amount of time, and then still not to know what it takes to be an academic, I thought was interesting. Um, and uh, how frequently in the course of the narrative that people in describing themselves would distinguish themselves from um, peers they saw critically who were planning it. So people, if people, if you, if you're too calculating, it's um, it's seen negatively. The idea that you know you should be doing it for out of this more of a calling mentality, even if the calling happens later, but not out of calculation. So um, peers who are who are um, calculating their career advancement are seen negatively, and that's not what we do, what we do. Um, as as I discussed in that new body of literature that I brought up, happenstance. Chance, luck um, was mentioned quite a lot, and I'd like to discuss that at the very end again. Um, interestingly, contrary to what the literature suggests, um, very few engaged in science for science's sake. Um, I don't know if that's a, a feature of today's, of our current generations, but the idea that you're doing something good for society um, uh, is sort of one part. Um, others who are doing it out of the joy and pleasure of learning. That's not the same thing as doing it for the sake of the scientific um, uh, enterprise, but more because it's, it's, I'm just it's passionate about learning. I really want to learn, want to share my learning, but I actually love learning. Um, so personal self-satisfaction um, or something Something can improve a lot of society. Um, we see it, we see difficulties in society today. Um, all of them, back in in in, in uh, coherence with the literature about vocation, referred to being really dedicated to their work. So they didn't know at the outset how much it would take. Um, but when they do, um, finding both the fun and the demands of it, balanced life is something that people uh, know how to spell but don't know how to live. Um, uh, often coming in uh, with the, the idea of autonomy, even if afterwards what they describe doesn't sound very autonomous, but the value of autonomy is, is mentioned frequently as important. Um, generating sharing knowledge and developing students um, are some of the, the things that, that they're dedicated to that, that brought them in and that they want to continue living. Um, so just to give a couple of, of illustrations and sort of short um, examples. Um, these are these are not the real names. Don't don't try to imagine the Eleanor G that uh, that I'm referring to. You, that's not her name. So Eleanor G is a is a professor in the U.S. in her 50s, and she <laughs> felt an, she is one of people who felt an early calling, not necessarily to academia, but definitely to um, to teaching. And then at university, discovered research and discovered the fun, the, the pleasure of of doing research. In her words, she fell in love with it. Um, however, didn't go straight into academia. Didn't stay uh, with with that, but went in, into industry after graduating, and there, while working in industry, um, was working in an organizational function um, that excited her so much she wanted to understand it and realized she wasn't going to understand it by doing it. Um, so she went back into um, uh, to, to, uh, the academia in order to understand what it was. And she emphasizes careers are a combination of making good strategic choices and luck. Um, Nathan E. is... Um, uh, in Germany, a German in Germany, and he is a, has a temporary position in his 50s, so difficult situation. Um, and looking back on his first academic post, um, he said, I got an offer to directly go into a project um, after finishing his, his studies, and before I really c considered what I wanted to do after my studies, well, I thought, mm, I'd rather do that than nothing. So, of course, you should do that project. So this, he didn't use the word stumbling into, but for me, it's an example of that kind of a, of you know, staying in academia sometimes because it, you didn't know what else you were going to do and why not this. Um, people often stayed because um, a mentor, or somebody showed an interest in them and said, have you thought about this, that you be could be good for this, um, but they hadn't thought about it themselves. So finding one's place in academia, uh, as I showed you in the beginning, the, the in each of the systems, we have clear milestones. 
So you'd think that it was pretty much of an objective process of, of finding one's place in academia. Um, but what I discovered is it's um, very much of a subjective as well as an objective um, process um, and doesn't necessarily correspond clearly to the formal career milestones. Um, so some of my respondents felt that they were a member of academia very early, way before they'd cut any milestone, um, already in their masters, for example. Um, uh, so I have some who were teaching already during their masters program, and th that already gave them a sense of being um, a member of academia. Um, a first conference presentation or a first time an article was accepted. Um, so that that though there weren't so many of them, but there were some. So before the academic system probably would have defined them as being a member of academia. Some. Um, quite a bit later, after attaining tenure. That happens in different countries at different ages. It happens, um, can, can, hap can happen quite early in France. Um, in, in the States, so my son-in-law is in his uh, late 30s. Um, and um, some of the people that I've spoken to, it's more like late 40s. So you work so hard, you d dedicate so much of your life and night times to this, and it's not until you're in your mid 40s that you feel like you belong. I mean, this is a it's tough, I think. Um, and some of them were still unsure about whether they'd found their place. And I want to emphasize that because uh, that's, you know how when you're conducting interviews, something clicks with you and think, that's interesting. Um, and uh, a colleague from France said, Je ne crois pas que j'ai trouvé ma place. I haven't yet found my place. And she's in her mid 40s. So I thought, that's interesting. What does that concept mean? She's well paid. She's well, you know, she's published plenty. So, but this feeling of I haven't really found my place, that is one of the st what stimulated me to consider. And then coming to here, I'm thinking, going geography, I'm going to think about place because Peter Moisberg had explained to me the difference between place as a concept. So I hope I'm using it right. Um, so that trying to think, what does it mean to find your place is something that, that got stimulated my thinking. Um, uh, and a few people, because I was asking them, so, you know, what about the future? Um, and are you going to retire? What are you going to do in retirement? Um, in the States, you don't have a mandatory retirement age. In, in Germany and in France, there is one. Um, but even if you have mandatory retirement, it doesn't mean you stop being an academic. So I wanted to know what people are doing there. And very few plan on stopping. Um, and quite a few said that they see retirement as the time when they can actually be the academic they always wanted to be, but have been, you know, haven't been able to do because of everything else that it entails to be an academic that they hadn't actually foreseen when they started. Um, so, um, illustrations of that. Ingo um, J. in Germany, a full professor in his 40s, he remembered responding to a phone call. Um, he had left academia for a while. Um, uh, was actually teaching in, a s in school, so he was still in education, but not in not in academia. Uh, and somebody called and said, "You know, you really should submit your application because this professorship could work well for you." Um, and he said, "I sense that the fire was still burning inside me. The academic fire is still there, um, particularly for this combination of disciplines." So, um, and then he got the offer, took the post. But it wasn't until he gave his first formal, I don't know, you, we don't have that tradition, I think, in, this, in the States that you do in Germany of the very, the very first, I call it here, commencement address. So it's not a graduation address, the first big public speech you give when you take on a professorship in Germany. So th that was when, finally, he felt he was a member of academia. Um, Hannah M., f a u in the U.S., a full professor in her 60s, she was also um, invited to return to academia. After in her case, she'd been working in the corporate world. It was a very steep learning curve for her to then move into you know, <coughs> teaching like that and become a full professor, which she succeeded. She said, I love academia. I love being in an environment where I'm always learning new things, but I don't like all the politics. Um, and in her, at her age, she says, I'm, I'm ready for a change, but she hasn't yet decided what that's going to be. So I didn't, in a way, I got the sense that she'd found her place because she really loved what she was doing, but didn't really fit because a significant part of it, it was not, did not correspond to um, what was a good place for her. So that, thinking about that, led me to think about um, uh, finding one's place in academia as a multidimensional concept. Um, uh, that involves maybe first of all finding an intellectual domain um, that corresponds to one, whether sometimes that was a discipline um, or a subdiscipline. 
sometimes it was a topic and, and, and other times it was a method. So some people just, they, d they develop a way of doing research, of, of, of understanding things that they feel they can apply to many other, um, uh, many different topics and that sometimes they become collaborators with other researchers who need their particular um, methodological approach and they don't really talk about the topic that interests them. So there's the intellectual domain that calls us, that we feel called to in some way, that we find at one point. Um, there's uh, finding one's place in an institutional setting, so which kind of institution, and that's not simply the distinction between a university and a business school or research center, because some people were talking about having been at this university, and for them, the, the, the culture was very unattractive, they didn't feel like they fit there, um, so they need to find another university or other place where they, they would fit um, the, the, the culture. Um, or in a, u in a unit within the university or research center. And this institutional setting can also in entail, so what kind of a role do you, do you feel like you're going to play there? And the third um, dimension is one I was trying to check the language yesterday, um, whether I'm allowed among geographers to use the word geographic, um, uh, finding my place in a geographic context. I didn't know if I can use the word geography here. So that's up for debate. Um <coughs> but I'm finding one's place. I have I need these three levels or three dimensions. Um and finding one's place can sometimes be I'm talking about professionally local, um that if the place that you that you're at is important for you professionally, um uh, or is it the national context or is it the international context? And then some of the people that I've spoken to, um, they could be doing it anywhere. It doesn't matter. The other two dimensions matter more and the location of their institution doesn't matter. Um, so those, those three dimensions, and then I was looking at, at the um, material and see so far I'm, I would say that I'm seeing three different kinds of pathways to one's place. Um, some take a very direct path once they've underst you know, understood which, what is their domain, um, uh, then they, they go straight for that and they s pretty much follow that um, during, their, during their, their, their career and have also found quite early than the place that they want to be doing it. Um, some, I, I call it at this point an experimental path, not in a psychological, technical way we were discussing it this morning, but an experimental path. They try things out and see what works for them. Um, often they discovered that the, f the, the topic or the um, uh, discipline that they started with at the beginning wasn't going to be theirs, um, so they needed to find another one and, and, and go, go into something else um, so that they, they moved on to, some to a different one. And some take what I would say at this point as a combinatorial path. They explore various ones and then find ways of combining them, bring them together. A um, couple of illustrations of these. So Barbara W. in the United States, in her 40s, um, full professor now, she came from a working class family and um, felt really out of her element in college. Um, it was just socially not her class. Um, uh, but became involved in research um, as a first year undergraduate student in, in a work study program. And uh, interestingly enough, it was the secretary who had noticed how engaged she was in this work study project and mentioned her to the senior professor who was looking for a new student who could work on a project. And she sort of created this, this the link. And um, that took off uh, extremely well um, so that she started publishing already as an undergraduate was publishing with, with, this, um, with this professor. Um, but she maintains even today that I've always felt a bit like an odd duck. So the sense of not fitting that social context coming from a, um, a working class family. Um, but uh, she deals with it simply by reminding herself, you know, you went into this because you want to understand these questions. So just do your thing. So maintaining her difference um, and recognize that that's, that's who she is and she's not ever going to feel totally part of that. But, but that's fine because she's getting to do what she wants to do. Um, Interestingly, in today's time in the States, she and sh uh, she's in a business school. Um, she has absolutely no interest in this whole impact question, um, in working with organizations. She says, I just kind of like being in the cave. I like working on ideas. So she's really found her, her space. Um, but that's been, for me, an example of a relatively direct path. An experimental path, example of her experimental path, path um, comes from Susan B., who is also in the, in the US, tenure track in her 50s, tenure track in her 50s, yeah. Um, she did grow up in an academic household um, and her parents already had told her 
as, in, as a young person, in no uncertain terms, as she put it, no uncertain terms, you have to go into science. So for her, it was going to be the natural sciences. Um, so she did. Uh, and she did enjoy the teaching, but realized uh, after a while that the, the field that she was in, she was doing a good job, but it wasn't her passion. It wasn't something she could envisage committing her life to um, uh, forever. Um, so she followed a more traditional path and interrupted her career um, with during the, the when her children were small. And then instead of going back into that area, looked for something else that she'd be interested in and found the field that that really excited her. Um, completed a completely new de degree in that, so she has a doctorate in one, doctorate now in the, in the other, um, and just really dreamed of now teaching as she had before, but teaching now in the field that she actually loved. And she feels a perfect fit with her current institution. Um, she tried several different institutions along the way in um, while getting to work while completing her doctoral studies and afterwards. Um, uh, is on tenure track, but even without tenure, says, I'm part of the academy, I'm satisfied. Um, so, yes, yeah, she hopes she will get the recognition of tenure, but even without that, she's where she wants to be. An example of a combinatorial path is uh, Katharina H. in Germany, um, who is in her 50s and has a temporary associate professor position and a director of a research unit, which I should have put here. She's been politically active since arriving in Berlin as an 18-year-old um, and uh, has managed to combine her um, political interests and activism throughout her academic work um, and has f they've fed into each other. So what she's learned in practice goes into her research. What she's doing in her research goes back into, into her practice um, at the local level, at the national level, and internationally. Um, and in the process, she's opened two new research fields. Um, she's had a hard time getting the recognition she deserves, which is why she still has temporary contracts. Mm. Um, the other dimension of um, finding one's place that s seems to me to be emerging from my, from my um, data is that I have some people who, and I'm using these terms and they may need to change, um, uh, some people seem to me to be making a place, and others seem to be taking a place. And uh, there's no value judgment on them, but <laughs> for me, the um, making, for example, making a new, um, opening a new intellectual domain, um, or contributing to making a new uh, uh, in intellectual domain, a uh, new field, whereas others you know, find quite quickly the field within which they want to make a contribution. Um, some uh, actually create a new institution or create new roles within um, institutions, whereas others find the institution and the role within that that, they're, that they've you know, fulfilled really well. Um, and some do also make a space uh, in which to engage professionally within their geographic context. Again, it could be, could be local, regional, national, or, or international. Um, so two examples here. I've got one <coughs> one placemaker <laughs> in in all three dimensions. I think I've a couple more, so it's not many, um, but but there are examples. So Bernard S, who is in France, um, professor and in this case dean now, in his forties, uh, when he came to his very first post, he already brought in an area that nobody else was working on, um, so created space for it there, created a new um, uh, curriculum for that. Um, and establish a group of local companies that was connecting with the, the region immediately. Um, and they, the c this, this um, uh, institution had never done that before, of creating what they in he ended up by calling it a club, later got called a chair, um, of, of companies who were interested in this area, willing to put their money where their mouths were, and willing to create access for research and were curious about the results of the research. Um, and that model that he created there has now been, been used in this institution for other topics as well. Um, and in addition, he is also, he was invited to join the list of um, um, the uh, a senior person in, a senior political official in the municipality, and it's quite a big one. Um, he is does not affiliate with any political party. He was invited because of his expertise, the expertise he's been building up um, in his school. And so for me, that's an example of having made 
place um, in, uh, in a field, in the institution, and in the geographical context. A placemaker in one dimension, um, for example, is again an, uh, somebody from France, uh, Christian. Um, he is a full professor in his 50s. He said his entry into academia was not programmed, it was largely a result of chance. Um, however, when I listened to his story, it was you know, chance, but once he was on the track, he was on the tracks. Um, he was exposed to different academic cultures during his studies, um, and during, um, yeah, during his studies in particular, and some of them he found it was really horrible. Um, so he decided when he got recruited um, to the uh, university that he's currently at, that he would, in a place where he saw the same kind of very individualistic and competitive behavior that he had found horrible um, during his own development, he decided he was going to create something that was much more collective, much more communitarian, um, and, and if for that, obtain funding so as to be able to protect it and develop young people within that. Um, so that was his solution to creating space within an existing structure, creating a different culture within that. Um, so just as... Perfect. Um, this is definitely work in progress. Um, and I have, m I have already some more questions to explore and I'm hoping you're going to add some to me. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether I'll be able to see in my data whether there are particular constellations of factors that are associated with the type of path taken, whether it be the, the, um, the, the direct, um, the indirect or the experimental or the combinatorial. Um, is there a, is the difference that I'm seeing, if it holds up, between place makers and place takers as I'm currently defining them, is it more a matter of personal style, personal a attributes, or is it more of contextual features that seem to lend themselves to that? I'm, I have a sense that the place makers um, in intellectual domains came at a time when, when something was starting to bubble up around this topic. And so they came, they were, if you want, fortunate to s be able to start posing themselves these questions then. But is, uh, is that fortunate or is that an element of their personal curiosity not wanting to look where everybody else is already looking? I don't know if I'll be able to tease that out. Um, I'm also trying to, I'm also very struck by this use of, the, of terms around luck, around chance, uh, good fortune or bad luck, um, in, in the um, narratives, I'm trying to understand that. So on the one hand, I may you know, share the idea of this happenstance theory. There are planned and there are unplanned situations, and the question is how do you deal with them? But I think it's more, more interesting <laughs> than that, um, particularly when one takes into consideration this, the way that people are distancing themselves from peers who they define as being calculating. So is it, do, does one use the word luck in order not to look like one is calculating? You know, I was lucky in that way you don't look like you're the one who, you know, put all the pieces in place in order to be, in, be able to take advantage of this. I, again, I don't know if I'm going to be able to tease that out, but I'm, I'm curious about it because it comes up in different ways. Um, I'm quite surprised that I am not yet uh, it could be a matter of how many cases I've looked at. Um, I am not yet finding interesting patterns that dif make explain differences between national settings. I'm seeing a bunch of individuals uh, so far, and not, oh, the f it's this is more likely in France, this is less likely in Germany. I'm not seeing that yet. Um, I'm not seeing differences, really, between the generations, and I would have expected so. Um, I would expect more differences between gender, and so far I'm not. So again, this may just be me and not my data, and it may be something that is just that you know, we have different systems, but we are human beings, and this 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 you know this drive to learn, this drive to to give knowledge, um, this drive to contribute somehow is something that that is not limited then by different systems. I don't know. Um, so I don't see enough patterns in, in that so far. Those are the questions with which I'm entering this room, and I, my guess is I'm going to leave this room with more questions from you guys that I will not be able to immediately, immediately um, answer. Thank you.